rock circles. That actually, that song by Lou Graham, a foreigner, is actually considered one of the worst songs that they had done. It's true. It's true. It's true. And I'm going to add more on, on that song later. <coughs> you know, research and opinion would argue, or at least agree, I should say, that the most common topic for songs deal with either love or heartache. Would you agree? Yes. Our world is consumed with our desire and need for love. and expresses itself in so many functional, sometimes very dysfunctional ways. And that's what today's message is. It's a love story. It's a love story. And like our favorite love stories from books and movies, this morning's Josh has all the same elements. It has desire. It has courtship. Proposal, even a wedding. The central characters of our love story is God. And B'nai Israel. God has chosen as his love the people of Israel and is pursuing them to enter into a covenant, into an eternal union. Now, love's fullest expression, as many of us are married know, is in a committed relationship, like marriage whose virtue is self-sacrifice and submission. To love as Messiah did, laying down self like he did on the altar of love. I'm talking this morning about a godly, biblical love that can only be realized by a genuinely humble people who are willing to give themselves away to someone else. Why do we do that? Why do we make that choice? What is in us at that moment we enter the chuppah to say, I am less than you now? Did you ever wonder about that? For as selfish and self-serving as human beings are, but there is a capacity within us to walk into the chuppah and say, not me anymore, but you first. How does that happen? What is in us? Maybe it has something to do that we are created in the image of God. No place under the chuppah. There's no place for self-centeredness. No place for it. And that's, yet that's what breaks up more marriages. This is about me. We start thinking about me. The most intimate expression available in this world of Messiah's love for humankind, for you and me, is expressed by the passion and desire that a bride and a bridegroom to be share. See, in the expression of marriage, coming to union with God is defined. It's there, you find it. What it is, what it isn't, of holiness and being set apart. According to Rabbi Shaul, in Ephesians 5 verse 1, we are to imitate God as his dear children and live a life of love just as also the Messiah loved us. Indeed, on our behalf gave himself up as an offering, as a slaughtered sacrifice to God with a pleasing fragrance. Similarly, Yochanan shares the same thought in 1 John 4, 16. Living a life of love, what do we do? We imitate God. Because why? Because God is love. And this is how love is defined in the life of Yeshua, in the Messiah. In Ephesians 5, 2, as Messiah loved us by his giving himself up as an offering, kapara, a sacrifice. We give ourselves away. Is that what we say? We give the bride away. She gives herself away. The groom gives himself away. There's, I don't know if any greater miracle on the face of the earth is that. That we give ourselves away to another. We give ourselves up to our bride, to our groom, sacrificing our self thereby to become a chad or one. Now I'm not talking about the counterfeit love of Valentine's Day. 
That's not love, brothers and sisters. That's sensual pleasure. That's predatory courtship. It's say me first, false love that takes whatever you want with little given in return. That's the love of the world, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> love of the world is not your best option. Better than nothing. Better than being alone. Right? I'm not talking about the love of the world today that's a corporate merger of careers so you can be mutually prosperous. Not the kind of love that he has brought me so much or been so nice so I guess I owe him. Not the you can give me life I want, not my parents think we should be together, we make a nice couple. Not the support me through grad school so I can make the kind of money I need until I meet the one I really want. <coughs> and definitely not the Hollywood romances that turn into short-lived wedding phone calls. That's not what I'm talking about. A study was done back in 2011. Psychologist Don Hobbs revealed that at the heart of 92% 92% of the songs that you all sing like this and others about love are actually at the heart reproductive messages. That's a real tactful way of putting it. In other words, what we call love in songs is nothing more than just a focus on hooking up. That's all it is. That's what's hidden in all those love songs. She discovered that these kinds of songs average 10.49 sex-related phrases in every song, in what the world calls a love song. Now, I'm talking this morning about true love. I don't think we get it. And we should know what that is. We should know what that is, and we don't. We walk around as born-again, spirit-filled, Messiah-like believers, and we don't have a clue. We think we do. But the real fruit of that, or the evidence of that love within you is, is in the fruit that you bear. And how can we have 52% of believers ending in divorce? As I said many times, every time somebody comes under the chuppah, half of you are lying. Half of you are lying. For better or worse, six is health until death do us part. Liar. Half of you lie. Now, I don't care what the circumstances and situations are, you can't get beyond that. You can't get beyond that truth. I'm talking about covenant love as it was meant to be. And nobody forced you into that relationship, nobody made you. Covenant love is an eternal love. And it's so desperately needed to be seen today. They've got to see something different from us. Our children have to see something different from us. Our neighbors have to see something different from us. They've got to see something in the workplace that's different than the rest of the world. And that kind can only be seen in what happened in Yochanan 13. It was just before the festival of Passover. And Yeshua knew that the time had come for him to pass from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own people in the world, he loved them to the end. And even Lamentations touches on this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Simply stated in 1 Corinthians from Rabbi Shaul, love never ends. Period. Love that doesn't selfishly separate, but selflessly enjoins. After finishing washing the feet of his Talmudim, right about the time of the third cup of redemption, Yeshua took the cup of wine and he made the bracha and he gave it to them, saying, All of you, drink from it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, my blood shed on the behalf of many, so that they may have their sins forgiven. But for this morning, 
let us celebrate a covenant union which took place 3,300 years ago between God and humankind. And all the elements that are part of the traditional wedding ceremony are represented in what happened at Sinai. I've got a few people here that I presided over their wedding ceremony. The hypocrites, Portier. Anybody else? I think I missed anybody. Yeah, yeah. I'm still waiting on doing Carol Dars. <laughs> All the elements that are part of a traditional wedding ceremony are represented there at Sinai. And together with some of the same feelings and emotions that accompany any commitment, like takes place on a wedding day, nerves, you know how it is. You're nervous, you're freaking out. Last minute doubts, fears, what am I doing? Yeah, my wife says it. I want to do it again. We just did this three years ago. Is that crazy? June 21st will be our third year. She says, I'm going to do it again. So, well, she goes, but, but, but I'm not so nervous now. <laughs> <laughs> when it came time for the bride, the mixed multitude, to step up to the altar to take their betrothal vows as part of the divine union, the scripture says they feared. They stood at a distance. What am I doing? That's what they're saying. What am I doing? I'm not ready for this, right? Anybody have those feelings? I'm not, what am I doing? I'm not ready for this. Probably Stephanie didn't feel that way, but many of us did. He'll see me as I really am. He's going to see me in my underwear. He's going to see me in my imperfections. He's going to see me in the morning when my hair is like going to different places and stuff, right? He's going to see me in my uncertainty. He's going to see me at my worst as well as my best. She'll reject me. She's going to see my belly. Right? She's going to hurt me, maybe. Maybe she'll disrespect me. Maybe she'll leave me. Maybe I shouldn't do this. <clears throat> All those fears and doubts, the enter in, hoping at that moment for an act of divine in providence to interrupt the event and make a way for escape, right? And then as we enter the vows of forever, a seedy voice, and I com a seedy voice within us comforts us. You know what seedy voice is saying? Ah, you can always get divorced. You can always get divorced. And that's exactly what 54% of Christians do today. According to Groucho Marx, famous sage of wisdom, he says marriage is the chief cause of divorce. <laughs> A lot of wisdom in that state. Ralph was driving home one evening, realized that it was his daughter's birthday, he had bought her a present, drove to the mall. Went to the toy store, he asked the manager, hey, how much is that new Barbie in the window? He said, which one? He says, we got all kinds of Barbies here. Which one are you talking about? He says, I got Barbie goes to the gym for 1995. I got Barbie goes to the ball for 1995. For the same price, we have Barbie goes shopping, Barbie goes to the beach, there goes Barbie to the nightclub. We have, oh wait, there's one more here. It's the divorced Barbie. How much is that? $375. <laughs> What? $375 for a divorce Barbie when all the others are 1995? So what's the deal here? Well, divorce Barbie comes with Ken's car, Ken's house, Ken's boat, Ken's motorcycle, Ken's dog, Ken's furniture. <coughs> Hebrew people had an appreciation for how God had blessed and delivered them, but maybe feared commitment. They're, they're people. You know, you read the, you read the Bible, and we, you know what we forget? We forget those are like really people. You know what I'm saying? We like read them as stories or something, you know, these little lessons. We're talking about real people, real life. Why do you think so much of the Bible isn't about what, what, was, 
what was the right thing to do in Scripture, of most, I'd say probably half or most of the stories are about the things that people did wrong. <laughs> but the lessons that they learned from those ridiculous mistakes that they made, not listening to the Lord who tried to head that off in the past in their lives, but they didn't listen to rebelled against it, and they got a train wreck of some drama or disaster in their lives and messed up not only maybe their families, their own lives, but maybe the Israel as a whole. <laughs> Messed up their lives. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt there are benefits of never being alone. Always provided for. Family. All that's very, very attractive. But fearing commitment, they wanted to leave their options open, still wounded from bondage from their previous relationship, which was Egypt. They liked the goods, but they feared the commitment. Right? How many of you thought, hey, this, this guy's a keeper? You ever look at personals? You ever look on the internet? What's the number one thing what most women are looking for? Financially stable. Right? Am I, I'm lying here, right? No. You know it's true. You don't want to be work and take care of some deadbeat, right? My ex did that. I mean, my current wife did that. I mean, it happens. The question this morning, what is your relationship with Yeshua? When you stepped up and recited your vows, I wonder how many had their fingers crossed. Union of a man and woman till death do you part has today become a union between significant partners till either one departs. We make our own vows, right? We make our own vows. We redefine what the union is meant to be. Goodness, it's not even between a man and a woman anymore. They're their partners. You hear the commercials now? Listen to the commercials now. This is about husband and wife. Your husband and your wife, you don't hear that anymore. It's by your partner. See how it's changed? The portion I chose for this morning defines what a commitment of love by God to his Am Segula or a chosen treasured people looks like. God is selecting a bride. And he wants that bride to be pure. And he wants that bride to be holy. And he wants that bride to be set apart. Rabbi Shaul in Romans he said, offer yourself as a sacrifice, living and what? Set apart for God. Life's not your own anymore. That's kind of what the package deal is. If you, come up to say, if you come up here and say, I do, I think your significant other is expecting you to do it. <laughs> it's kind of the idea. Maybe it just seems too simple, but that's kind of the, the deal. Okay? And this is the process in traditional weddings or shidduchim. The first step of the traditional marriage process where a father of the groom selects for his son a bride. A wedding proposal was made. Will you become a kind or one with me? I give you my word. You have my covenant promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. And though technically this is an arranged marriage, the marriage still depends upon the consent of the bride. Because God from the beginning arranged his relationship with you. But you've got to consent to and in Shemot 19.8, the people answered as one, everything the Lord has said we will do. <laughs> Liar. Liar. And these problems, and nobody likes to be called a liar. We gotta own it. We gotta own it. My hands as high as anybody else's. We gotta own it. These promises made at the proposal to support the bride. Marital conditions and provisions for both later will be written or ketubah and then signed as part of the Erosine or the betrothal service. The commitment to be set apart is now accepted. Now it's time to declare their intentions publicly in the betrothal ceremony or the Erosine. And part of the preparation is customary for the bride to take a ritual immersion in the mikvah or a baptism as spiritual cleansing or preparation for the betrothal ceremony. So, in Shemot 19.11, God instructs them to what? To wash. 
And in verse 13, await the sound of the shofar. Baruch Abad Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the people did as they were instructed and watched. And then in verse 16, in the morning of the third day, there was thunder and there was lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain. And you all, we read, Joel 2.16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chuppah. And so after the mikvah, they are ready. They are ready for the ceremony. The couple would approach the chuppah, literally the canopy, for a patrol ceremony. They would enter it under it to make a public declaration to be married, which wouldn't happen for at least a year. You know, I've done several patrols. Sad thing about a lot of patrols is they don't follow through with the wedding. They go halfway. And that uh, public declaration to be married wouldn't happen for at least a year. Until the Nesaim or the consummation service, they would live their lives set apart for each other, obligated to the conditions of the Ketubah, the Word. So for those of us today who have confessed Yeshua, what is your canopy? What is your chuppah? What is your covering? Do you ever wonder what that is? What is your covering? The truth is, your canopy or your chuppah is the blood of Yeshua. The blood that was put across the doorpost at Pesach. And certainly the written word would contain written promises of God to the bride, their obligations to each other. Also, this would be part of the covering for their marriage. The couple's union is wrapped by God, one with each other and him. And when the shofar blast sounded, remember that the event to Mount Sinai, Moshe in his role as the best man, he brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood near at the base of the mountain. See, to come up to the bima or the chuppah is symbolic of coming up to that mountain. You are coming up, you are making aliyah. And during the ceremony, you don't come right under the chuppah, right? Did you come right under the chuppah, Clippers? No, I invited you in. You came in front of the chuppah. Not until I extended the invitation to come forward did you come in. Moshe escorted the bride toward the base of the mountain and when he left them to go up to retrieve God's word to his bride, covenant promises, contained his ketubah or the Torah. So as part of the betrothal ceremony, a gift is given to the bride. For the Hebrew people, it was land. It was land. It was a place where they could dwell together as a family. Shemot, and it's no different in the kingdom. He goes to prepare a place for us. That's our gift. And we, it goes before us. Shemot 12, 25, when you come to the land which Adonai will give you as he has promised, you are to observe this ceremony. And in verse 46, and they will know that I am Adonai, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt in order to live with them. I am Adonai, their God. Once the betrothal is over, a couple was legally married. Was legally married until their wedding ceremony, which would take place, as I said, at the father's house. And it was a seven-day celebration during which the bride and groom would enter the chuppah again, a bridal chamber built onto the father's house where the two would live and, of course, consummate their union. And during the time period between patrol and wedding, the groom would build it. So later in Shemot 25.8, God provides the plans for his house. They are to make me a sanctuary so that I may live amongst them. It was the Mishkan. Now one thing we haven't discussed yet, who on earth is the groom? It's the groom. Well, you find your answer in Ephesians 5 again. Rabbi Shaul in verse 25 to 27 compares Messiah 
the Son of God, to a bridegroom. As for husbands, love your wives. Just as the Messiah loved the Messianic community, indeed gave himself up on its behalf in order to set it apart for God, making it clean through immersion in the mikvah, so to speak, in order to present the Messianic community to himself as a bride to be proud of without a spot, a wrinkle, or any such thing, but holy and without defect. If we are acting in an unholy manner, or treating something as holy as unholy, will we enter in? Think about that when you read scripture, and there are scriptures that say certain things are holy, but not being treated as holy by the body. Are they entering in? You answer that for yourself. And again, in Revelation 12 or 21 9, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And finally, from Revelation 19 7, let us rejoice and be glad. Let us give him the glory, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb. Sing a song of celebration. Lift up a shout of praise, for the bridegroom has come. His bride has prepared. Herself. The image portrayed in the event of Sinai that of Israel, natural born and the grafted, being betrothed to Messiah himself. The Father has chosen for his Son those of us who will accept his offer to be holy and set apart. To accept that offer. Who will keep themselves pure for the wedding supper of the Lamb. To us that are his bride, and Yeshua has given his word to honor protect and cherish us. He's committed. Yeshua is committed to meet our needs and take us to the depths of intimacy and relationship with Him. That is part of the word, the ketubah, the covenant promise. He will never leave you, as I said, or forsake you. His covenant is eternal. It's marked in His blood. But why, when time for the ceremony to begin and God spoke His vows, did the people stand at a distance? It sounds like a pretty good deal. What were they afraid of? Why didn't they come near? Patrollal ceremony had defined limits set by the Torah. So why did people stay outside the perimeter? Why were they afraid to get close? What are you fearing, brothers and sisters, to get close to the Lord? What are you fearing to tell the truth, to live the truth, to live a holy set-apart life, to go both feet in, what are you afraid of? That you're wrong? Or that you'll be admonished by neighbors, friends? What is it that you're afraid of? I'm not afraid. Of course, then I hear Yoda saying you will be. <laughs> and at times, at times there's reasons that, you know, some of the things that the enemy brings against you, it does... Challenge your ability to resist that fear. It does. For one thing, people today just plain fear commitment. They do. And that's the irony of it. That's why so many people live together today. And I did a whole message on that a couple about a year ago, two years ago. And the reality is that 60% of you that live it together, you're more likely to get a divorce if you get married. So you think living together is the, the ticket? It's not. All you're doing is priming the pump for a divorce. It's true. Because all the while, the other person's thinking, why do they commit to me? Maybe I can't trust them. So many want to maintain freedom outside the limits that God has established for Torah. Yeah, I, I, maybe it's unclean, but I'm sure it's not going to cost me my salvation. Have you heard that? I'm sure you have. Maybe I'm going to work on a high holy day. I'm sure, you know, God is a God of grace. He'll let me slide in that. No, I, I'm working on Shabbat. Uh, that's okay. God is a God of grace and mercy. He'll, he'll, he's, he'll ride with that. He'll go with it. 
He'll accommodate what I want to do. Right. He'll submit to my will. Because that's what you're saying. God will submit to my will and way, my desires. And he'll be cool with it. Because some of you must think that he has to or something. <laughs> you do. I think, I think some of you really believe that. Well, he's got to. He's God. He's got to do what I want him to do. He doesn't want to look bad. <laughs> that point is humorously illustrated in this following story of a husband and wife who are sitting quietly in bed reading when the wife looks over at him and asks the question that every man fears. Besides the one question, besides the one statement, which is, we have to talk. Okay. She asks this question, honey, ready for this, guys? You had this asked yet? I think, yeah, I've already had asked this question. I have asked, been asked this question. Okay. I'm sure you all have been asked this. What would you do if I died? Would you get married again? Come on. You know you've been asked that. <laughs> Definitely not. That's the right answer, guys. <laughs> Definitely not. Well, why not? Don't you like being married? Of course I do. Then why wouldn't you remarry? Okay, okay, I'll get married again. You would? <laughs> would you live in our house? Sure, it's a great house. Would you sleep with her in our bed? Would you let her drive my car? Well, probably because it's almost new. Would you replace my pictures with hers? Well, don't you think that would be the appropriate thing to do if I got married to somebody else? Would you give her my jewelry? No. no I'm sure she'd want her own. Would she use my golf clubs? No, she's left-handed. Oops. Here's, here's the problem. While we appreciate the benefits of commitment, we dislike the requirements. It always means we have to give up something. To give up certain freedoms like other men and women and dedicating self to only one. And Rabbi Shalul expresses in Galatians 5.1 for what the Messiah has freed us for is what? Freedom. Therefore, stand firm. And don't let yourself be tied up again to a yoke of slavery. <clears throat> So what you think is your freedom is actually a yoke of slavery. That's the irony of this. You have freed yourself for bondage. We think standing outside the bonds of uh, commitment in multiple relationships is somehow that you are free. But you're not. You're in a place of fear. You know why? Because you're afraid to choose. You're afraid to commit. Our spiritual protection has everything to do with positioning. Our spiritual protection and covering has everything to do with positioning. How do I know Psalm 91.1? Those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, we who are in His place are safe. When you are in His place... You are safe. His place of covering, his place of protection, his place of covenant love. The story of a lamb that was desperate and a huge wolf was on its heels and rapidly gaining ground and seeing a temple nearby, the lamb makes a quick decision and dashes through a narrow opening in the wall. And the wolf smiling this wicked <laughs> smile <clears throat> said, you might as well come out. You might as well come out. The priest is going to slay you if he catches you in there. You're a sacrifice. You're dead meat. The lamb thought for a moment and then replied, Nah, I choose to stay here. It's better to be sacrificed for God than be devoured by you. It's better to live a sacrificial life than to allow the enemy and the lies of this world consume you. Hasatan will devour you. He devours all who are in bondage to him. Whereas God liberates those in his care. So, 
Every day is a choice. What are you choosing today? Where are your hearts this morning? Is this just for you another message? As soon as you walk out the door, whatever. Ask yourself this question. Where are your hearts this morning? Are you on the run? Are you standing at a distance? Or have you laid your heart on the altar? I'm giving you a new command. That you keep on loving each other in the same way that I have loved you. You are also to keep on loving each other. What's he repeating there? He's actually repeating Shema and Vahavta. That's really what he's saying. See, by loving God, each other, we're loving God. We think somehow that, that by loving this, you know, the, God, that we can do that apart from people, but you can't. The love of God is evidence in the manner and spirit that we love each other and treat each other. Especially those who are closest to us, those who we're committed to. That's the fruit, the evidence, the testimony, the witness of your love for God. Have you been faithful? Have you been faithful to our room, Yeshua? Have you honored your ketubah, your vows? Have we remained under his covering, his protection, under his kupa? I wonder how many today are outside of God's house. I wonder how many of us are outside of God's covenant. I wonder how many of us are running from his way to the world's way. I wonder. I guess the question needs to be asked, will you grab Yeshua's outstretched arm or will you continue to have your hands on? That makes, makes the cross. Fingers are crossed. Remember, that's the spirit that put them on the cross. People who had said that they walked with him, betrayed him, denied him, ran from him. That's the spirit. One spirit is of self, and one spirit is of self sacrifice. I just hope this morning you would consider very strongly if you really love God to open your hands and reach out to brothers and sisters. That's the only place they're going to know real love. And when you do that, when you reach out to help and to bless and to love your brothers and sisters, this is his heart. This is genuinely love. That's it. You know, that song from Lou Graham, a foreigner. Not long after he did it, he was at odds with some of his bandmates. You hear it all the time. Eventually, he left for him. I don't know the reasons. You never know what could, I mean, I've been in bands. It's like, a, it's like a marriage, it's like a family. You got egos, out, you know. Some people are responsible, some aren't responsible, you know. It's very frustrating sometimes because you get, it's like being on a football team, you know. You know, you're playing, the a, you're playing your A game and the other players are just slacking. It's frustrating. You have to depend upon the other players. You have certain goals, aspirations, and the other people, maybe they don't want to share the same goals or maybe they don't invest as much into the process. It's a hard place to be, done for years. So Lou Graham leaves for him. <clears throat> but in 1997, something happened to him. April 1997. And it's then that he found out what love is. The question was answered for him. He didn't have to seek any longer. He knew. Go ahead, Daniel.
join Petra for that song. Everybody thinks that, you know, once you accept the shoe and your heart's all rosy, it's all good, right? Everything's changed. Everything's wonderful. Not the case. Right after he did that, he developed a brain tumor. He was unable to sing. Because it affected him in such a way that he had no energy. He couldn't push those notes anymore. Eventually, you know, even with his excess weight, he was able to go back out solo. But right after that confession of faith, his world actually tanked. Better for worse. Sickness and health, richer and poorer. Until death do you part. <coughs> do you want to know what love is? Sure. It's just that simple. It's not complicated. If you know... If you love, then you know God. If you don't love, you don't know God. I don't know how much simpler it can be. But maybe, uh, maybe you want to recommit. Maybe, maybe you want to recommit. Maybe you want to come up. Maybe Linda will play a little piano. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll retake some vows here. Maybe, uh, maybe you just want to kind of been standing at a distance. You want to come up to the mountain. Maybe you want to come up to the canopy. Maybe you've wandered a bit. Maybe you've been separated. Maybe you've walked a little unholy. Maybe you're wondering if that I've treated holy in an unholy way. Perhaps maybe I've defiled something that's very precious and set apart. Maybe that's the case. step up. 